Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. We examine what health care reform could mean to you and the latest on the task of eliminating poverty in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The health care landscape continues to change. A few weeks ago, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. A few of the key elements include requiring individuals to be covered by health insurance, sets up a health care exchange, prohibits insurance companies from capping benefits, gives small business tax credits for providing insurance to employees, and it allows more vulnerable adults to be covered by health insurance. Governor Mark Dayton says Minnesota will continue to create its own health insurance exchange, although its future is a bit cloudy. And everybody agrees we're much better off to develop our own exchange, a Minnesota exchange. In fact, you know, we've heard from the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington that we're one of the leading states right now in, in the development of this, and we can be a showcase for the nation. And, you know, it, it's, this has gotten mired now, unfortunately, in, in ele election year politics, especially the presidential election. But no matter who's in charge uh, next uh, January, the challenge of providing health care in the most cost effective way for all the citizens of this state and this nation is going to remain. And just to have it become a, a you know, political food fight right now is very unfortunate. One of the next major steps in the Affordable Health Care Act is to develop a health care exchange, which is a private market for people to purchase their health insurance. Commerce Commissioner Mike Rothman joins me now to talk a little bit about where Minnesota is in this process. Commissioner, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Commissioner, let's begin with that question. Is the task force essentially on track to have its recommendations by the end of the year? Well, the task force came out with recommendations last year with legislation uh, proposals and then um, there was legislation that came out of that. <clears throat> so the task force has done a big chunk of work already. Yes, uh, we are, the Department of Commerce is now in the planning and design phase of building out the exchange, which uh, is a new health insurance marketplace for up to 1.2 million people that will be purchasing their insurance through the exchange. We're on track, we have a deadline of January 1, 2013 that Minnesota has to meet. Uh, states that want to make their own state-based exchange have to do uh, certain things by that date. Otherwise, the federal government will make uh, a one-size-fits-all solution uh, for those states that don't. And we are on track, and we've been working very hard to stay on track. What are some of the most recent developments in this area? Well, the biggest one uh, was this week. We announced a, a big contract with Maximus, We'll also be working with some other vendors like IBM, um, uh, Connecture. It's, a, it's a, a $41 million contract. It's a major piece of the exchange to develop the technology infrastructure, sort of the nuts and bolts of how this thing will work from the inside to do things like make sure people uh, can, will have a website, they'll have ability to uh, find out whether they're eligible for subsidies, enroll in health insurance and purchase the health insurance right online with a lot of other great features like showing them where their, who their providers are, insurance agents and brokers, and an opportunity to compare you know, the health insurance plans that they may have. So Commissioner, for people who aren't very tech savvy, this could be very daunting for them. What is your office intending to do to try to maybe help hold some people's hands? Well, there's a lot of uh, things that we're doing. One is uh, taking a look at uh, call centers, people can call in, actually talk to people live online, on, uh, right there in our office. And there are uh, individuals who will be working through social service programs, the counties who will have access. So there are about 700,000 people in Minnesota who currently get their, uh, whether it's Medicaid or some other state program, who will have others helping them navigate. They're called navigators. Uh, that will help them and assist them through the process. So there'll be some people to help them. Okay, I'm sure that'll be uh, beneficial for people to know. And we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you, the future of this, while the U.S. Supreme Court did weigh in, the future is still a bit cloudy, depending on 
this next election cycle. So given that, do you move forward as if this is a done deal or is that kind of in the back of your head that this might be for, for nothing? Well, from the beginning, the administration has taken the view that the uh, state-based exchange is the most important thing we, uh, that we can do for uh, healthcare development. We also um, have, with the ACA decision coming down, uh, it's been definitive and we're pleased with the, with the decision uh, eliminating that uh, cloud as you indicated. Um, and then we will continue to, to move forward to plan and design. Otherwise, we will not be able to make that January 1, 2013 deadline. I think um, it's important for us to stay focused on that, and we'll see how everything else plays out. Let's talk a little bit real quickly about who this exchange could most benefit. A recent study by the Minnesota Department of Health and University of Minnesota School of Public Health revealed that there's a high, the highest uninsured rate at this point of 26% is the Hispanic Latino community in Minnesota. Black Minnesotans is roughly 18%, and it goes on down. Will the exchange target populations to try to help improve these numbers? Absolutely. Uh, part of, as I was indicating, there are 300,000 uninsured Minnesotans, and a lot of those are people you just mentioned in that, those population groups who will now have an opportunity and will get their insurance purchased through the insurance exchange. Uh, we will also have community-based navigators to help those populations. Uh, we are also working with uh, tribes. Uh, we have partnerships we're developing with tribes in order to make sure that they have access to the exchange and in a lot of different ways. We'll have consumer-based approach to make it uh, consumer-friendly and, and the ability for people like that to, to purchase on the exchange. They'll also have access to new tax credits and subsidies to bring down the cost of their insurance to save money uh, for individuals and, it, it, uh, and our goal is to make it as easy and get the information out to people as possible. Coverage in Minnesota's public insurance programs, including Medicare and Minnesota Care, right now is at 29.2%. <clears throat> Excuse me. What do you think is going to happen to Minnesota's public programs? We're taking a look at that. The health, uh, the governor's health reform task force is looking at the broad picture in terms of what those programs are. Uh, we also have some economic modeling done by economists and actuaries, trying to figure out, you know, what will happen. Um, but it's all uh, uncertain right now, and we're just going to have to see uh, how it plays out. We also have some options and choices to make in Minnesota with respect to our public programs, and th those are the things we're looking at at the health care, uh, Governor's Health Reform Task Force. You know, assuming that a major barrier to improving the number of insured people is the cost of health insurance coverage, how do you think the exchange might help lower these costs? Well, importantly, under the ACA, um, through the exchange, people, individuals, and small businesses will be able to get tax credits and subsidies to purchase their insurance. So on average, uh, people will be able to save uh, about $500,000 in their insurance cost. Small businesses will have access, they already do actually, have access to tax credits for purchase of insurance. And they will, be, and once they get, they, they purchase the insurance on the exchange, that will bring down the cost for them. And uh, it's projected to save overall about $1 billion for individuals and small businesses. At this point, are you and others involved in this task force trying to engage the GOP to get them more involved in in creating the exchange? Well, from the beginning, actually, when we when the administration started and, and myself, we uh, wanted to make sure that all, all people, businesses, uh, consumers, advocates, had an opportunity, and particularly legislators. But they had held off. On both sides of the aisle, uh, we had offered uh, participation to both Republicans and Democrats to be on the task force. Uh, the Republicans declined. Um, from the beginning, we've also said that um, they have a standing offer, really, to join us. Uh, I've met with the Republican uh, health care leadership. Um, you also have to re remember that some of the Republicans are co-authors of the legislation that came out of our task force. So we are we're focused on making sure that uh, the dialogue happens. Uh, we're meeting this afternoon. We offered to meet with uh, Republican legislators and they accepted, so we're going to proceed with that. Uh, just to talk about the exchange, where we are and what we're going to be doing. So. We hope that that will happen, and to the extent we can, we'll keep moving forward. Okay, Commissioner Rothman, thank you for your time today. We hope to follow this. We will follow it. Of course, we hope to get you on later in the year. Thank you. Minnesota voters will weigh in on a constitutional amendment on voter photo ID this November 
maybe. The issue was brought to the state Supreme Court with oral arguments heard on Tuesday. The heart of the suit directly challenges the legislature's authority to pass constitutional amendment legislation and have the Secretary of State present it to the voters. The bill authors say it's now a waiting game. Uh, so I think it's just best to sit back, let them do their job, uh, and the best example that I could possibly give you uh, that you know, the, uh, the appellate courts hold it pretty close to the vest when they were making a decision to just point at Justice Roberts. And the answer to your question becomes mm -hmm. pretty obvious. We don't know what they're going to do, except that I have every confidence that they are, uh, based on uh, the uh, reputation of the court, the questions that were answered or asked today, uh, they were very engaged. I think that they're going to uh, study this issue very carefully. When the U.S. Supreme Court issued its ruling on the Affordable Health Care Act, we caught up with the Senate Chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, David Han, to get his perspective on that ruling. Right now, we'd like to show you a portion of that interview where he discusses his thoughts on a health care exchange. You've been opposed to this act, but you've been very vocal in your opposition to a health care exchange. In the capacity you're in now, will you support it or will you work to try to craft one that's positive for Minnesota? Well, the first thing I would want to do is get the governor to talk about what it is that he's doing. He's got a group of people that he's paying uh, millions of dollars of taxpayer money to act as a governing body for an exchange, but he has refused very directly to respond to any questions about what they're doing, what kind of policy he wants, what is he putting in place. He's questions clearly doing from it. you? Questions from our committee, questions in our committee to his representatives, Commissioner Rothman and others have been very, very uh, uh, clear about not responding to those kinds of questions. And so nobody knows. And I think that would be the first thing is to find out what is the governor trying to accomplish. I don't think that we can do anything to enact an exchange without the help of the legislature, without something positively done by the legislature. And I think that before we do that, we want to know what the governor has been up to. And I think we need to look at what are the requirements under the federal law and whether or not uh, it makes any sense to have a Minnesota version or if in fact uh, there really is no difference between what we can do as a state and what the federal law requires. And again as chair of this committee how do you see your role assuming you're in this position again next session when it comes to beginning to implement and roll out other facets of, of the Health Care Act? Well, I'm going to be continually looking for ways to preserve the independence of the state of Minnesota in their ability, and I believe it's a constitutional requirement that we retain our independence as a state. We are not an administrative unit of the federal government, and I think it's very important that we do everything we can to make sure that laws that affect the people of this state are written by people that are elected to govern this state. And I think that's going to be something we'll all have to work at. Senator, my last question for you is, Minnesotans obviously are going to be asking a lot of questions about what this means to them. What do you think this means to them? Well, I think it faces, uh, confronts the public with a very fundamental choice. Uh, what kind of government do they want to have? Do you want to have a government that is going to assume very broad, very expansive, very intrusive powers into very personal parts of our lives and turn over massive amounts of regulation and taxing authority? Or do we want to uh, restore the idea that individuals, families uh, have the ability to govern their lives? That, that to me is the ultimate question. I think that the public needs to ask themselves that when they go to the polls in the fall and, and ask, are we electing people who are going to respect that or are we electing people who are looking for further expansion of federal power? When Governor Mark Dayton first took office, his first official act was the early opt-in to the federal Medicaid program. This action brought in roughly $1.5 billion in federal money to the state and enrolled tens of thousands of Minnesotans into health coverage. The Minnesota Hospital Association supported that move. Mary Cranky from the Hospital Association joins me right now to talk a little bit about how they benefited and future action as well. Thank you, Mary, for joining us. Thank you, Julie, for having me here today. Um, just one little clarification, which as everything you said was correct, um, the action by Governor Dayton was the first portion of the population that is now eligible for the Medicaid enrollment. Governor Dayton had the authorization to go up to 75% of 
of the federal poverty limit. And that was what he had the authorization to do from former Governor Tim Pawlenty. Um, now with the ACA, the American, uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, commonly referred to as the ACA, we now have the ability to go up to 133% of the federal poverty guidelines. And that so. was my next question, but let's okay. talk a little bit about how many people have been impacted thus far and how the hospitals have impacted and um, essentially what this means for both hospitals and Minnesotans. Great. Well, the initial population, as you said in your introduction, has been about 85,000 people are now in the Medicaid program before, but not all of those folks were uninsured. And this is one of the reasons that we really felt it was important for all policymakers to understand Minnesota was already providing coverage for about 50,000 of those folks, either on the General Assistance Medical Care Program or in Minnesota care. So not all that population was uninsured. And as we look at the expansion going up to 133%, likewise, a lot of those folks are on Minnesota care too. But potentially, in answer to your question, it would be about an additional 95,000 people who are either uninsured or on Minnesota care. Do you think the state has benefited from this move, particularly because it's moving these people from, as you said, state funded yeah. programs into a federally funded program instead. And there have been some financial impacts to the state um, thus far. Right, well, a couple different, there's both the um, care side of that question as, where, as well as the financial side for hospitals. Hospitals, physicians, dentists, chiropractors, all healthcare providers, we have to pay that 2% provider tax that supports the healthcare access fund, which supports the Minnesota care program. So obviously moving to a program that is funded through general tax dollars rather than the provider tax is obviously better for hospitals. But even from a care point of view, the Medicaid program has a different benefit set than the Minnesota care program does. Minnesota care has a sliding fee scale that people have to pay. It has a $10,000 cap so it is not usually considered as good a benefit set as the Medicaid program is so it's been better for the individuals too and as we've recently as we talked about real briefly the the Affordable Health Care Act or we'll also call it the Obamacare because that is yep, it's a yep, loosely commonly known absolutely. as absolutely and recently the Supreme Court did rule on it and the Medicaid enrollment part portion was singled out in that ruling with the high court stating that essentially states cannot be forced to opt in and risk losing federal funds so is there any angst with this decision it, well actually it was I, I when in reading the decision the words that Judge Robert used were gun to the head, which is kind of funny for a Supreme Court, Court Justice to use the terms gun to the head. But what this high court ruled was they didn't want states to suffer the enormous penalty of losing all of their Medicaid dollars by not doing the expansion. And if you step back from that and think about nursing homes and home care and other folks already on Medicaid, if a state opted not to do the expansion, they would in essence have lost all of their federal Medicaid dollars. So what the, what the Supreme Court ruled was that was too high of a threshold to make the states do that. They said in the wording was that it could be a m minor penalty, but not one of that magnitude. So obviously there's a little bit of play here. What does that mean as a minor penalty? So we'll have to work on that. The states do have the option now of not doing the Medicaid expansion. In looking at what has happened in the last just few days, a number of the Republican governors are trying, I think, to piece together um, options that might give them a little more flexibility in the Medicaid program but perhaps still move forward with the Medicaid expansion. Do you think this ruling by the Supreme Court perhaps opened up an entire can of worms that didn't exist this before, like more it, questions it, instead it, of fewer? It, well, that's interesting you ask that, Julie, because I just have read a copy of a letter from the national state Medicaid directors. Every state has a Medicaid director. We have one. These are really smart folks who have asked a lot of questions like, do you have to go up to 133%? If you don't go up to 133%, are you still going to be eligible for the 100 percent federal participation. Another question that a lot of folks are asking, do, do you have to do it in 2014? Can we ease into it as a state doing it in 2015 or 2016? So they're asking a lot of now implementation questions that aren't necessarily negative, but it does mean we are going to have more of a state by state program rather than a national threshold. So every state is going to have slightly 
different criteria and different program in Medicaid, which ironically is kind of the way we have it now. So. Mary, let's move away from the Medicaid portion yeah. and talk a little bit more about the big picture. Obamacare, uh, of course, requires people to have health coverage mm -hmm. or they do face a fine. So what I'm curious is once it's implemented and people have had time to shop around yeah. and, and hopefully get get the insurance that they're supposed to have. So if somebody turns up to a hospital without insurance, A, will they still receive care? And B, is it then is the onus on the hospital then to turn this person in? How, how do you expect well, that to work? Well, I think one of our biggest concerns, quite frankly, with the exchange is that a lot of low-income folks will be given a subsidy to buy insurance. Will they actually do that? Will, will they be able to maneuver the health insurance exchange and make that happen? But the amount of subsidy are they more likely to buy a high deductible health plan? Now, high deductible health plans have worked great for a lot of people. I don't want to be against all high deductible health plans, but for low income folks, most people aren't able to pay those deductibles. So what the hospital will see is still some uncompensated care associated perhaps with a $6,000 deductible, $10,000 deductible. Will Minnesota set a threshold on how, how high those deductibles can be? So in answer to your question, the hospitals will still have some uncompensated care. And what about the person who doesn't have health coverage at all? Will it be on the Will that will the hospital then have to report that person? Well, people below 133%, this is sort of the new magic number, there's not going to be a penalty on those individuals financially for not having insurance. I think it's yet to be seen how the population above that threshold, how that really works. The subsidies go up to 400%. So for a lot of folks maybe who work at big companies, under an ERISA plan, their insurance may not change. For a lot of folks who work at small businesses, we currently have health insurance, but we'll probably, our employers will likely drop their insurance and be shopping on the exchange. And just ironically, the Hospital Association is a small employer, so the other day we sat down and said, we're going to have to figure this out probably as consumers too. So it's going to affect a lot more people, I think, than people originally thought. So fair so, to say a lot of questions remain unanswered. Yeah, I, I think that the Supreme Court decision cleared up some pictures for us, like is it constitutional to have the individual mandate? Can the Medicaid expansion move forward? But there's a lot of implementation questions and um, a lot of things the state still has to determine. Will we adopt the early Medicaid expansion? One of the other questions is on will we do the exchange or will we pick a basic health plan for people below 200 percent. There's another question that for people above 200 percent and for people below 200 percent. So lots of questions still to answer. I so. sense bringing you back in in a few well, months and we'll <laughs> talk about this further. Well, might know more by then. So Thank you Mary. We Thanks, appreciate your Julie. time. The Ladder Out of Poverty Task Force was established to develop a series of recommendations for the legislature with a goal of ending poverty in Minnesota by 2020. The task force met Wednesday to vet ideas to present to the 2013 legislature. We want to create the evidence that families who set goals together and are accountable to, e to each other should not be under this kind of rule system that we have in our public assistance system. And that that needs to be our goal for a new public assistance system. Um, because right now, their capacity, once they, as Senator Jung Jungbauer said, once they start on public assistance, their capacity is now focused on navigating that system. That's what they spend their time doing. And from the Citizens League perspective, this is backwards because now you're using your capacity to prove your neediness. You're not using it to develop, to be independent. I think today's meeting is just kind of um, talking about how do we keep things going. Um, since uh, Representative Lanning and I have been excited about it, we've, we've kept the ball rolling, we've tried to move things forward, we've tried to, to build on, um, you know, just getting uh, jobs, getting people to have a hand up instead of a hand out. And while we're here and excited about it, that's good because we can keep little pieces rolling, but you know, now we're kind of handing off the baton, so we have to have a strategy for that, and that's what we're going to talk about. Do you, is, can you unveil that strategy at this point? Well, I guess we haven't fully developed it but in uh, um, I guess in real time what we're trying to do is, is say are we using the right language are we using something that gains people's interest 
and you know what can we do to kind of go off of the the short piece of the legislation we passed in the last couple of sessions. In your time as co-chair of this task force, what would you consider your greatest accomplishment? Well, that's hard to say. It was one of those things where I wasn't excited at first, and then when I really got excited, I mean, just to, to look at um, assets, for example, and how we count folks' assets to qualify for programs, I think that's probably one of the one of the biggest things I've worked on, to make sure that if you get in a situation and you have some assets, not all that's counted against you because of the way um, the situation happened to you to, to need some help. Has it been a bit more challenging because of the, the economy, particularly over the last couple of years, to try to reach this goal of eliminating poverty by 2020? Well, obviously, that's been, a, that's been a great challenge. But really, kind of our goal is to start from square one and say, do we have the right uh, job training? Do we have the right... Um, programs in terms of teaching people about finances. How do you start a savings account? How do you start thinking about saving for those monthly payments and, and organizing your finances? And, and a lot of that has come a long way in the last uh, 10 years since I've been here, and that's really exciting. So, Senator, tell me, do you, as a co-chair and as somebody who has sat on this commission, do you think that the goal of eliminating poverty in Minnesota by 2020 is possible at this point? Well, I guess I believe you're never going to eliminate poverty. The idea is as folks go in, it's not the same people. You want to get them out of that habit or some folks are actually born into to families that are, have been in poverty and it's a cycle. And the idea is to break the cycle and I think we're working a lot towards that and uh, you know, really supporting the groups out there, circles of support, things like that out in the communities that, that actually uh, bring folks together to form relationships. That's the key. The government can't help somebody out of poverty, but if you can get folks out there to stand by you um, during that time to, to uh, you know, help you out one-on-one, -on -one, that's the key. It's that relationship building and knowing that when something goes downhill again, you've got somebody to talk to. Those are the kind of issues we really build on. When I read the website, it said that this commission was supposed to have some recommendations by June of this year. Did that happen or is that going to happen today? That's really happening today. Um, we're going to come out and we're going to talk through that. Is and again, part of that I think is when we when we deal with the word poverty, for example. Um, you know, most people just go, oh, hmm, forget about it. You tune out. We're, we're trying to th you know, think of new words, maybe something else that gets people excited. Um, and and kind of again, we've talked about how do you build on that relationship. So if we're putting people together and somebody actually comes into that scene, into that family, and walks with them during that time. That's the kind of thing we're trying to build on, but, but how do you find the verbiage that gets people excited? And do you, as you prepare these recommendations to present to the legislature, do you find it a bit more challenging knowing it will be an entirely different legislative makeup coming in? You don't know who the majority will be necessarily. Does that play into this, or do you, do you just put the recommendations out there and come what may? That definitely plays into it. You don't know what the makeup is, and that's the key, as I kind of said, getting somebody excited. Um, when I got involved in it, uh, as I say, I wasn't really excited, and I thought, well, it's just another thing. But as you went out in the communities and seen some of the programs that were built, you got excited. So how do we pass that torch on? That is the key. And that wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching this week's Capitol Report.